America prepares. All America alters its pattern of life and work to meet the demand for protection. Industry is a double step to supply the sinews of safety, the armaments of war that an embattled world must have if democracy is to survive. And the beat of feet sounds over the land. Feet intent on training, on growing fit for whatever destiny holds ahead. Heroes, every one. Heroes by the million. Men who abandon home and vocations that they may be ready to defend democracy if necessary. Thousands of anti-aircraft guns and thousands more in production. America's coasts must be invulnerable. While more and more bombers roll off the assembly lines at high-powered factories, growing air armadas stand ready, guided by pilots second to none. Men training with bombers, with fighters, with pursuit planes. Intrepid men learning every formation, learning to keep the air above America free. On guard to the end that Uncle Sam's manpower in industry, manpower in action, shall continue to answer America's call to arms. The story was page one last September. Janet Cook wrote about a little boy hooked on heroin by his mother's lover. A story the Post said yesterday was simply not true. She had not interviewed any year old heroin addict. And that uh, uh, the quotes attributed to him were fabricated. So the Washington Post is publishing this morning an explanation of what went wrong with Janet Cook's prize-winning story, a tale that prompted a massive wild goose chase by the city looking for Jimmy, a little boy who did not exist. It involved the Metropolitan Police Department, the Department of Human Services, and the D.C. School Board. It involved hundreds of people and thousands of man hours. The Post has apologized to the city for the inconvenience, and the publisher, Donald Graham, says Janet Cook also falsified her job application to the Post. She said she'd finished college at Vassar with a graduate degree from the University of Toledo. Neither credential was true. James Wooten, ABC News, Washington. Photographs of the inaugural proceedings were intentionally framed in a way, in one particular tweet, to minimize the enormous support that had gathered on the National Mall. This was the first time in our nation's history that floor coverings have been used to protect the grass in the mall. That had the effect of highlighting any areas where people were not standing, while in years past, the grass eliminated this visual. This was also the first time that fencing and magnetometers went as far back on the wall preventing hundreds of thousands of people from being able to access the mall as quickly as they had in inaugurations past. Inaccurate numbers involving crowd size were also tweeted. No one had numbers because the National Park Service, which controls the National Mall, does not put any out. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period, both in person and around the globe. Even the New York Times printed a, photo a photograph showing the, that a, a misrepresentation of the crowd in the original tweet in their paper, which showed the full extent of the support, depth, and crowd and intensity that existed. These attempts to lessen the enthusiasm of the inauguration are shameful and wrong. Then explain you did not answer the question. Why did the president send out his press secretary, who's not just the spokesperson for Donald Trump, he, could be the, he is also serves as the spokesperson for all of America at times. He speaks for all of the country at times. Why put him out there the, for the very first time in front of that podium to utter a provable falsehood? It's a small thing, 
but the first time he confronts the public, it's a falsehood? Chuck, I mean, if we're going to keep referring to our press secretary in those types of terms, I think that we're going to have to rethink our relationship here. I want to have a great open relationship with our press, but look what happened the day before, talking about falsehoods. We allowed the press spray to come, the press to come into the Oval Office and witness President Trump signing executive orders. And uh, of course, you know, the Senate had just confirmed General Mattis and General Kelly to their two posts. And we allow the press in. And what happens almost immediately? A falsehood is told about removing the bust of Martin Luther King Jr. from right. the Oval Office. That, no, that's just flat out false. And the and pool writer. And it was writer, corrected immediately. Why, Chuck, but, why but was it said? No, Chuck, me, why was it said in the first place? Because everybody is so presumptively climb, negative. Climb into the head of that no, reporter. that it's okay. No, but excuse me. Oh, no, 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 no. That reporter was writing. To the, uh, on behalf of the press pool, that that I falsehood that. got spread three thousand times but it does before not it excuse, was corrected. Excuse and me, it's it still does out not there. excuse. And you did not answer the question. I did you, answer no, your question. No, you did not. You did yes, not answer did. the question of why the president asked the White House press secretary to come out in front of the podium for the first time and utter a falsehood. Why did he do that? It undermines the credibility of the entire. White House press office no, on day don't one. Be so, don't be so overly dramatic about it, Chuck. What it, it, you're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains Wait a minute. Alternative that facts? There's... Alternative facts, four of the five facts he uttered. The hey, one Chuck, thing he why, got hey, right Chuck... was Zeke Miller. Four of the five facts he uttered were just not true. Look, alternative facts are not facts. They're falsehoods. Chuck, do you think it's a fact or not that millions of people have lost their, their plans or health insurance and their doctors under President Obama? Do you think it's a fact that everything we heard from these women yesterday happened on the watch of Barack Obama? He was president for eight years. Donald Trump's been here for about eight hours. Do you think it's a fact that millions of women, 16.1 million women, as I stand here before you today, are in poverty along with their kids? Do you think it's a fact that millions don't have health care? Do you think it's a fact that we spent billions of dollars on education in the last eight years only to have millions of kids still stuck in schools that fail them every single day. These are the facts that I want the press corps to cover. I, and these are the, this is why I'm here at the White but House I understand to this. change what I don't awful understand numbers is, like that. That is not what yesterday was about. So you yes, have not answered the question. You did not answer the it's question. It's what this presidency the, is going to be about. You, you sent the press secretary out there to utter a falsehood on the smallest, pettiest thing. I don't think anybody and can I prove that. No Look, I actually don't think that it. maybe this is me as a pollster, Chuck, and you know data well. I don't think you can prove those numbers one way or the other. There's, there's no way to really quantify crowds. We all know that. You can laugh at me all you want, but I'm, I'm very glad. I'm not laughing. I'm just Chuck, befuddled. I'm, well, but you are, and I think it's actually symbolic of the way we're treated by the press. The way that you just laughed at me is actually symbolic of the way, very representative of the way we're treated by the press. I'll just ignore it. I'm bigger than that. I'm a kind and gracious person. These are just dishonest, terrible people. I'm telling you that. <laughs> terrible people. It almost isn't news that President Trump launched yet another attack tonight in his relentless battle against the media, except for what else happened today. A California man was arrested for making violent threats against the Boston Globe. In one of 12 calls to the paper, Robert Chain allegedly said, you're the enemy of the people. We're going to kill every effing one of you. Who else has been calling the media the enemy? A few days President ago, Trump. I called the fake news the enemy of the people, and they are. You know, CNN, fake news, MSNBC, you know, that's really the enemy of the people. And it's totally uh, common for presidents uh, to criticize the press. Uh, all of them have done so. To label the press a domestic enemy uh, is a sharp departure from any historical precedent. It's the threatening calls began after The Globe and more than 300 papers across the U.S. published editorials criticizing Trump's attacks on the media. The citizenry has to be informed about, uh, about what's going on so that they can govern themselves. It's a, it's a pillar of democracy and self-governance. And the idea that the president, my president, uh, their president, uh, would declare the press to be an enemy of the people, we found uh, deeply alarming. The president's attacks are nothing new. Because they are the fake, fake Disgusting news. But the fear now is that they could fuel violence. In another call, Chain allegedly said, as long as you keep attacking the president, I will continue to threat, harass, and annoy the Boston Globe. 
So there's the concern is President Trump, by the use of his language and attacks, um, giving sort of an open door to some people to say, you know what, I'm going to go do this. It's the Washington Post, the New York Times. That doesn't seem to worry President Trump. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. If you guys want to be peaceful, be peaceful. You want to be violent, come to me and I'll... As you saw, that man hit the camera phone out of our photographer's hand. He mine was not hurt. He identified himself as media and was recording the video in a public space. Washington. And just days ago, New York Times reporter Kenneth Vogel shared a threat he received on voicemail. Imagine getting this message. You're the problem. You are the enemy of the people. And although the pen might be mightier than the sword, the pen is not mightier than the AK-47. And just remember, Ken, there's nothing civil about a civil war.